Hello. Welcome back to the Space School Log. Today we'll be doing What If Obi-Wan Left the Order for Satine. Before we begin, special thanks to all of our patrons. Get ready for episode 3 of the miniseries, which comes out this Saturday. Our story begins in the year 40 BBY on the planet of Mandalore. Two Jedi Knights were currently protecting the young Duchess from bounty hunters and mercenaries. Master Qui-Gon Jinn had separated himself from his student and the Duchess, as he made an effort to try and find the bounty hunters and end this incursion. Though it wasn't going to go as well as he had hoped. See, Mandalore was under a civil war that had started nearly two years beforehand. The civil war ravaged most of Mandalore. It was a war between the old Mandalorians and the new Mandalorians. Though this war started when the old clans picked a fight with the peace-craving people of the new Mandalore. The tragic of this Mandalorian civil war is that a majority of Mandalore's population saw eye to eye with the new Mandalorian way, believing that if the warrior ways were to continue, then Mandalore would cease to exist. The planet itself was struggling, barren landscapes across the surface of the planet, and destroyed and rusted cities covered the entire landscape. The capital city at Kaldabe was ravished, and even on that same capital city, Satine saw her own father die protecting her people from the old Mandalorians. The travesty of such occurrences saw Satine continue to try and prop up a peaceful governance as her sister joined the same insurgents that got her very own father killed. Mandalore was in ruins. The makeshift capital of the planet at Sundari is where the majority of the people of the new Mandalorians were located, but it didn't make them safe. The old Mandalore waged a war in a society that chose a greater stance on a galactic stage. A younger Satine, than she already was, rose within the ranks of the political atmosphere inside of Sundari, and after her father's death in the former capital of the planet, she rose to become the successor in her family, as a Duchess of Kalvala, though this task wasn't as easy as it seemed. When she rose to Duchess, she was only 14, and she had to piece together a fallen society. The pressure was on her, and she began, and truthfully, as dire as the situation was, her works towards peace was recognized on the galactic stage. Which is why, two years after the war began, the Galactic Republic and Supreme Chancellor sent two Jedi to help the Duchess deal with the war effort. Because of long-standing treaties between the Republic and Mandalore, the Republic couldn't send more than Jedi Knights. It's how Obi-Wan Kenobi ended up here. The Master Qui-Gon Jinn knew that Sundari was no longer safe for the Duchess, and so he made an executive decision to move Duchess Satine off-world while the conflict was resolved. She was the image of peace, and if the old Mandalore killed her, then the chances of Mandalore ever recovering were little to none. Qui-Gon moved the two of them to Debrun, believing that Concordia wouldn't be a safe location for either of the two of them either. Though these mercenaries were ruthless, and they were Mandalorians of the old way, and they were hunting the two of them, two children, tracking their every movement, which left the young Padawan in a tough bind. He and Satine were both only 16 years old, which made this very stressful for the two of them. Kenobi himself was a bit out of his element. He was a fine student of the Force, but being on the run from trained Mandalorian bounty hunters wasn't exactly what he was prepared to do. But he and Satine were sent off alone, as Qui-Gon tried to work out diplomacy between the warring Mandalorians before they completely destroyed their planet and themselves. Years of warring had destroyed the planet's surface, and it was only a matter of time until they destroyed what little remained. Regardless, on Debrum, Kenobi and Satine had plenty of time alone. Qui-Gon paired the two of them up because of their similarity in age. The two of them were both 16, and they would likely get along with each other, considering both of them carried a fine amount of sass and mental toughness, which because of, they hit it off relatively quickly. Though them hitting it off didn't actually mean they fell in love at first sight, it meant they got along because they were forced to. Two kids on the run from murderers trying to keep the other alive. The dynamic was stressful and difficult. Being around someone you never met and trusting them with your life was the challenge of this dynamic, but it ended up working. Ducking in the caves and spending nights next to each other with a small, hardly visible fire. The broom was rather fine, but that night wasn't, when the two of them got attacked by a swarm of Venomites, which were tiny little poisonous bugs. Maybe the caves weren't the best hiding spot. It beat hiding out in the open until poisonous arthropods try to make a meal out of you. Kenobi during this, in an epic moment of swagger and resourcefulness, picked up Satine and escaped the cave, jumping down and sliding down the side of a large hill. This heroic act was ultimately ended, with Kenobi unceremoniously dropping Satine at the bottom of the hill. She did land on a sharp rock. Yeah, not the greatest moment for Obi-Wan, though Satine didn't want to embarrass him, so she played it off like it didn't hurt, even though she knew in her mind that that would become a permanent scar. Obi-Wan couldn't get over it. Embarrassing. One of those little cringy moments as a 16-year-old that lives with you for the rest of your life. The type of cringe that keeps you up at night and jars you from your peace with a shiver and creepy crawlies. Regardless of the fall, 
The two kids escaped into the darkness. Because the sound of jetpacks could be heard in the distance, the Mandalorian bounty hunters were catching up to them, and the Venomites didn't help. Luckily, it was nighttime, and that could provide them more time to escape into the darkness, because the Mandalorians mostly hunted them at night. It was a better way for the Mandalorians to try and sneak up on the Jedi Padawan. But Satine and Kenobi were smart about this endeavor. They took turns and they made a very emphatic point to take watch while the others slept. While Satine was no warrior, she had no issue defending herself, and so the two of them took shifts at night. Kenobi had the first shift, and Satine had the second shift. It was a highly balanced routine, and it made sure that the both of them had trust in the other, and that they felt protected by the other. These moments created a large bond between the two of them. Sure, Kenobi was a Jedi, but even he felt the bond that built between the two of them within the first couple months on Dabroom. Being always on the run and always looking after each other was as romantic as it got. This left the young Jedi confused. His emotions were certainly natural, but he didn't care about the Duchess more than the Jedi, or did he? He knew the answer, but did she? Of course, in the little moments, it was easy to tell. The little exchanges of eye contact, the silly smiles, the dilated pupils, I mean, what more? The closeness of snuggling up when they didn't have a fire. Sure, it was a bit survivalist, but this kind of trust wasn't easily found or built. No, no matter the situation. The holding hands and, yes, the glow on each other's face when they looked at each other. Okay, maybe it was love at first sight, but it just took some time to get out of them. One night, during Satine's shift, the two of them found refuge inside of an abandoned rancher on the far side of Debroom. It was quiet, peaceful, and completely abandoned, though luckily it did have some supplies. There was a fresh water resource, and there were blankets and heat inside the building. It allowed the two of them some time to recover from sleeping on rocks, dirt, and next to trees. The two of them were lined up in a window. It was Debroom's winter season, it was just starting to get as cold as it could get during the year. Freezing temperatures with snowfall. There was no better time for the two of them to discover this location. If they were outside, it would be unbearable. Survivable, but unbearably difficult to do though. The two of them kept all the lights off because they didn't want to be seen or heard from. It was pitch black outside, and the peacefulness of the snow was electric. Sitting on the windowsill, Satine watched over the landscape of the planet, stuck in her thoughts. Of course, many of those thoughts landed on the boy who sat next to her, asleep. But the rest of those thoughts returned to her people. How could she effectively help them? She was just 16 years old, and leader of a planet whose tradition it had been for over millennia to be warriors. How could she reform that by herself? There was so much pressure and weight on her to succeed, she didn't even know she could plausibly even think about Obi-Wan. She knew she liked him. She was fairly confident she loved him, but her responsibility was to her people. If Qui-Gon was successful, then she would have to rebuild a society from the ground up. And yet, the cost of all this, while she was on the run, was the lives of millions of her people. The pressure mounted up on her, and then the sounds of jetpacks jarred her from her thoughts. She shook Obi-Wan and told him that the mercenaries were here. Obi-Wan's eyes shot open, bloodshot, as he leapt from the windowsill and asked her where they were. She pointed out the window, and Kenobi peeked through the blinds. He could see the Mandalorians landing, three of them to be exact. Obi-Wan put his finger over his lips as he grabbed her hand and ran down towards the stairs. Kenobi scouted out the entire rancher before they settled in it. Obi-Wan used the force to creak open a hidden little room under the stairs. Satine looked at Obi-Wan a little confusedly, because she didn't know he found this. Obi-Wan pushed her in first and then got in behind her. He closed the gap and then looked through the ripped apart piece that had fallen off with all the years of rust and decay. The Mandalorians walked into the home, kicking the door open and turning the lights on, searching for life forms. Kenobi rubbed his eyes, making sure he was awake enough to defend Satine if they found him. His hand sat idle on his lightsaber, waiting for the Mandalorians to do something rambunctious. They kicked over furniture and searched and searched everywhere. The search would go on for 30 to 40 minutes before they left the building. Kenobi took a deep breath, and then the sound of fire could be heard. Both of them knew what was happening. Kenobi told Satine to go outside the back. He was going to deal with the Mandalorians. She looked at him, and then he gently pushed her out towards the back door as he ignited his lightsaber. Obi-Wan ran forward towards the front of the house. All Satine could hear were blaster shots and the sound of a lightsaber. And then it was silent. The sound of snow drowned out everything. There were a good couple inches of snow on the ground, and the snow here on Debroom could very easily get up to a couple feet. Satine stayed silent. Fear ran down her spine. She feared for Obi-Wan's life. And then the light of the fire started to extinguish. And then the night became darker. 
She turned around to figure out what was happening as she saw Obi-Wan and nearly jumped out of her skin, running towards him and wrapping her arms around him. Obi-Wan made a cunning remark about how it was just cold outside and that she should probably just come inside. The sarcasm and sass that radiated off the two of these could knock the galaxy into submission. Regardless, Kenobi told her that he put out most of the fire. The building was opened up a little bit, but if she came in, he could try and cover up the damages and make sure there was a little bit of heat that was getting out. Though Obi-Wan made a point to tell her to avoid looking out the front of the house. They needed to make the best out of this scenario until the snow passed by. Chances are there were other mercenaries still hunting them, but the snow would likely cover up the bodies of the dead. And that was the truth. There were more mercenaries out there hunting them. They both knew that. But they'd brought themselves a couple of days by hiding in here. Obi-Wan would get a cover over the hole burned in from the fire, and then he and Satine would spend the rest of the night talking about what came next for them in this journey. Neither of them knew what came next. There was fear, of course. This was short-term fear, by the way, not long-term fear. Satine and Obi-Wan were planning on where they would go after the snow melted and how they would get there. They were using a hollow map for reference because they would spend another month on Debrun before picking up and heading over to Concordia, quietly, without the knowledge of House Vizsla, knowing that they were there. Of course, at this point, they had no real reason to distrust Pre Vizsla or his house, but they were just keeping a low profile because of the severity of their situation. Their final month together on Concordia would cement the bond between Ben and Satine, a step further. Nicknames, inside jokes, and affirmation of how close they had become, though not yet acknowledging that they had fallen in love. Then one day, they would get a communication from Qui-Gon Jinn that it was time for the Duchess to sign a peace treaty. The war had ended, and it was time for them to pick up the pieces. She was excited to return to her planet into peace, but nervous, because she didn't know what would happen next, since she was on the run. She didn't even know what happened on Mandalore. She didn't have any communication with Mandalore since she left, and when she returned, she would be devastated. She would also be really sad because she didn't want to let go of Obi-Wan who she called ever so frequently Ben. When Satine returned, the barren landscapes were even more scarred. They were ravaged. And when she returned to Sundari, it was in shambles. She couldn't even go to the capital of the planet because it was completely destroyed, and the loss of life was terrible. Her sister bo vanished. She joined up with some mercenaries and hadn't been seen since the last battle. Satine's family was in shambles as well. Both of her parents were killed by the insurgents, and she no longer had her sister to be her friend through all of this. But Satine knew that she couldn't allow her personal matters to distract her from what she needed to do. And those personal matters, too, included Obi-Wan. But she wanted him. Did she need him? No, but she wanted him. She was strong on her own because she was a leader. Even at 16, her people looked to her, to herald in a new era of Mandalore, an era without war and an era without the old ways. Because upon her return, she learned that in two years, the death count was 2.5 million, which accounted for more than half of the entire Mandalorian system's population, including all the moons and all the inhabited areas within the Mandalore system. Satine's heart broke. So many lives lost for nothing. Literally nothing. She signed in the peace treaty and once more stood as Duchess of Mandalore. Before the Jedi left, she had one final chance to talk to Kenobi. Satine, I'm told by Master Qui-Gon that, that we are to depart for Coruscant. I will. I'm going to miss, miss you so much. My dear Obi-Wan, I have something to tell you. I, I don't know how to say this, but I want you to stay. I know and understand your love for the Order, and I would never want to get in between. I'll stay. Forever. But Obi, my loyalties are to my people. I have to serve them and rebuild everything that was lost. Then I'll be here by your side until the time is right. Because if you want me to stay, then your people are my people. Obi-Wan, it's time to say goodbye. It's been an honor serving you, Duchess. Master, I don't know how to tell you this, but I'm not going back to Coruscant. I'm staying here with Satine. I know, Obi-Wan. I know. I'm very proud of you because you have shown me what you truly value. And as someone who has felt those same feelings, I respect you. I know you have made the best decision for yourself, and that is all that matters to me. Remember, Obi-Wan, trust in the Force. It will always guide you. I will always be here if you need me. Qui-Gon smiled softly at his student as he bowed to Satine and turned around and began walking away. Qui-Gon could feel it. Their bond was too tight to have been ripped apart, but Qui-Gon wouldn't say anything unless Kenobi brought it up, because it was truly Obi-Wan's decision. Qui-Gon had once fallen in love with a Jedi, but he decided it would be best for him to stay a Jedi and not forgo the ways of the Code. But the reasoning for that is that he believed there was more to his journey as a Jedi, as if his journey was preparing him for something great. 
Qui-Gon departed Mandalore and begun his journey back to the Jedi Temple. Inside the palace at Sundari, a tear fell down Obi-Wan's cheek. He loved the Order, but the truth is, he left because Satine said the word. Had she not, he wouldn't have. But he loved her no matter what. He would do anything for her. When Obi-Wan turned around with a smile on his face, he wiped a tear away. Satine smiled at Obi-Wan, and then two of them hugged. Satine told Obi-Wan that she was happy he was staying here with her. He inspired her to be better, but now the real challenge began. Obi-Wan knew what to do. He knew it wouldn't just be the two of them like it was when they were on the run. Now they were going to be working to bring Mandalore into that new era. Satine immediately got to work, building a cabinet around her to help her out. At the same time, Obi-Wan did whatever he could to help her out as well. He could feel the stress radiating off of her. Sadly, it was more stress than when she was in danger every day, running away from mercenaries every night and every waking moment. The stress of taking care of her people was more overbearing than the stress of staying alive. Obi-Wan knew she was a true leader, the one needed to bring harmony to a destroyed planet. On the other side of the galaxy, Qui-Gon Jinn approached the Jedi High Council to inform them of his mission to Mandalore and how it went. Where is your apprentice, Master Qui-Gon? My apprentice decided that his journey with the Jedi was complete. He chose to stay with the Duchess. As for Mandalore, nearly 2.5 million men, women, and children were killed. The planet was laid to waste in two short years. But the people are in good hands. The Duchess Satine will lead her people from the rubble. Certain of this are you? Indeed. I also want to inform the Council that I will not be taking on another apprentice. Instead, for the time being, I would like to serve alongside my former master. The Council was fine with this. As they all began discussing amongst one another, many of the council members assumed that Satine would fail and that the Republic would have to go back to Mandalore and pick up the pieces of their failed state. It wasn't that they didn't like Satine or her chances of being a leader. It was the fact that she was 16 and she was taking on the remnants of what essentially was a genocide of her people. She lost millions of inhabitants to a pointless war. Sure, the old Mandalore seemed to be gone, for now, and the chance of redemption was certainly possible. It just didn't seem plausible. On the other hand, Qui-Gon would find his former master and inform him of everything that had happened. Dooku was compassionate to his former student, and understanding the situation was perfectly fine with having his student with him again. Dooku and Qui-Gon hadn't spent a lot of time with each other in the period of time since Qui-Gon took Obi-Wan on as a student. Dooku and Qui-Gon spent time with each other, catching up and talking about why Obi-Wan made the choice he did. Dooku was seriously impressed, because his impression of Obi-Wan was that of a student of the Code, rather than a student with an open mind. Not that there was anything wrong with the Code, but he just assumed Obi-Wan wouldn't make such a rash decision. This actually gave Dooku hope that the younger generation of Jedi would have more free will, though it would take time for that to come to fruition if that was true or not. Anyways, Dooku was preparing to go on a mission with Mace Windu to Raxus to recover the dead body of Councilmember Master Katiri. Meanwhile, on Mandalore, Satine was working 18-hour days. She was signing bills into action and structuring a government. She didn't see Obi-Wan at all. That's because her beloved Ben was out in the streets helping, using the force to lift rubble from the ground, working with paramedics and undertakers to make sure that the people that were killed in the conflict got proper burials. They had to work fast. The war took so many lives and the streets had a very rancid smell. The disgusting nature of the war sat on the footsteps of Mandalore's new capital city, and the people were horrified at what they could so easily do to themselves. But they came together, and while Obi-Wan wasn't wearing traditional Jedi garments, people around him knew he was special. He wasn't doing this on behalf of the Republic nor the Jedi. He wasn't even doing this on behalf of Satine. Sure, he was here for her because of Satine, but he was doing this for the people of Mandalore because they needed something to believe in. They needed to believe that there was hope in the galaxy, and he was playing a crucial part in ensuring they knew that there was peace in the galaxy and it could be found here on Mandalore. But the tragedy of Mandalore was heavily affecting planets around the Mandalore system. While Satine was working to ensure her people were in good hands by rebuilding an established government and constructing a more suitable government to rule on behalf of the people, she was also making sure that planets around Mandalore Mandalore system didn't fear Mandalore. Because if the systems around Mandalore feared her, then she and her people would begin to suffer. Satine didn't want Mandalore to see that fate, so she did everything she could to bring diplomacy to the planets around her. Because in a modern galaxy, the most important thing someone could have was allies. It could open up trade routes, business, travelers, and so much more. Satine recognized that, and she was consistently working through holograms to communicate to other planets around her that message. These planets were many, such as Mon Cala and Narshada. 
Satin went from one call to another. For a typical person, this was exhausting, but for a now 17-year-old, she was wearing the pressure on her shoulders. Day and night, she hardly slept, and the times she did, she was mostly awoken by night terrors. Because she and Obi slept in different rooms, many nights Kenobi would be awoken by her night terrors and come running to her side to comfort her. Oftentimes, she wondered what would have happened if she hadn't said the word. What if she didn't tell Obi-Wan how she really felt? How would she handle this on her own? See, Obi-Wan didn't take the pressure off of her, but he gave her the comfort she needed. He gave her the space she needed too, because oftentimes, once she was done for the day, she needed time alone, time to meditate, time to think. Obi-Wan understood this. He didn't want to disrupt her time alone, but the times he did was to make sure that she had eaten enough during the day or that she was doing all right. The two of them never argued, but it wasn't because they had a perfect relationship, it's because they respected each other's boundaries. Kenobi knew when the time was to talk to her, and when the time was to not talk to her. He understood, but he could also feel how stressful things had gotten for her. Many times during the week, she would leave Mandalore, and what made matters worse was the fact that many core worlds, including Coruscant, were breathing down her neck. The Core Worlds were trying to force her to join the Republic fully. While Mandalore wasn't against the Republic, it also wasn't directly a part of the Republic. It was a bare relationship that didn't demand too much from Mandalore or the Republic. It was very hands-off, but the Senators of the Republic were hungry to add Mandalore to their ranks, and so, when Satine wasn't fighting to build hospitals or schools for her people, she was fighting the corrupt Senators of the Republic, telling them off and defending her planet like a true Mandalorian, just without the armor and domestic terrorism. During this process, as often as possible, Obi-Wan would leave kind things for Satine. Nothing too difficult, but enough to remind her of how good of a job she was doing. It wasn't the bare minimum, but it also wasn't so ginormous that she would get annoyed at it. Obi-Wan from time to time, or just about every day, would leave her a handwritten note for Satine. Whether it be in her bedroom, her bathroom, her throne, or even in the dining room, where she often ate alone at night. It's not that Obi-Wan didn't want to spend time with her, but he made her people his people, and he was often helping in the reconstruction efforts, which were going extraordinarily well, because they were putting behind them the civil war and heralding in that new era of peace. Other things Obi-Wan would do was leave flowers, sweets, or even little trinkets or jewelry that she could wear and keep with her throughout the day, so that she knew he was always there for her and with her. It was these little things that really helped her maintain positivity. Satine wasn't swimming against the current. She was being pulled into the riptide with her arms and legs tied behind her back. She was hardly staying afloat because every day there was a new issue with the reconstruction, or there was a damaged building from the war collapsing and crushing a dozen citizens, or a schoolyard being too unsafe for the children to play in. A revolving headache of issues that never seemed like they could come to an end. The amount of time that Satine and Ben were spending on this reconstruction sped up because they were always so occupied, and so what happened, the days turned into weeks, and those weeks turned into months, and those turned into years very slowly. The time for Obi-Wan and Satine would be very beautifully brilliant, because as they grew together in their bond, they also watched a planet grow. It was so elegant. Mandalore's beauty returned, and the capital of Sundari, after two years of reconstruction, looked brand new. Ben and Satine were both 19 at this point, and their efforts had shown to be great. Yeah, Mandalore still needed fixing, but a majority of the planet was seeing the benefits of this new era. The new Mandalore began to see positivity, not just on world, but within the galaxy itself, as Mandalore began to shine exponentially. Satine was able not just to rebuild on her planet, but build relationships across the galaxy. Her pacifist ways, while flawed, were working exponentially in this time of reconstruction. She no longer had to work 18 hour days, as she lowered it down to 10 hours a day, which was still a lot, but it meant that she could sleep more and spend time with the love of her life which she got to do as Obi-Wan was no longer needed in a majority of her construction programs. As the two of them got closer, they thought about the possibilities of a royal wedding. The two of them now slept in the same room, and Satine didn't have night terrors as frequently. Because Satine and Ben had more time for each other, they were able to enjoy each other's presence, realistically. This involved walks through the newly constructed and still growing gardens and parks in Mandalore, romantic dinners in the palace dining room, or just simply staying in nights where they got to enjoy entertainment. During this time, Obi-Wan grew his hair out, and even so slightly, as trying to grow a beard. Satine didn't really have much to say on the beard, but she certainly preferred the shaved face. But she loved that Ben was trying out different styles for himself. 
For another couple years, all would be essentially alright with Mandalore. Outside of Mandalore is a little bit of a different story. Satine may have built up a strong surrounding of allies, but the Sith had returned. Jedi Masters Qui-Gon Jinn and Dooku found a Sith assassin on their journey to Naboo, which led them to Tatooine. They also found a young, very powerful with the Force child on Tatooine, and they freed the boy from slavery. Though the wisdom of the Council seemed to be against the idea of allowing the child to be welcomed into their ranks. They did send Dooku and Jin back out to Naboo to free the Naboo from the Trade Federation. Satine saw this blockade of Naboo as even more of a reason to distance herself and Mandalore from the Republic. There was already tension brewing within the Supreme Chancellor Valorum, but Satine made a point that she didn't want any involvement with anything. Regardless on Naboo, Dooku and Qui-Gon Jinn would face down Darth Maul. Though with Dooku being a part of the Sith, he knew Maul and, and he knew that he and Qui-Gon couldn't kill the Sith Assassin. Dooku saw this as a way to keep Maul alive and possibly persuade his student to join the dark side. During the lightsaber duel, Dooku used the force to cut off Maul from the two Jedi. It was a very simple but also an unnoticeable trick, but Qui-Gon wasn't stupid. He picked up on it immediately, but he just didn't say anything about it. He didn't want to acknowledge it, and he made a very particular point to avoid acknowledging it, because he was curious where his master was going with this whole plan of his. There had to be a reason, being that Dooku didn't just do anything for no reason. Qui-Gon didn't know that Dooku had recently removed Kamino from the archives of the Jedi Temple. There was a larger plan at play here, and Qui-Gon was not yet aware of it. After the victory at Naboo, Qui-Gon would return to the Jedi Council, and the Jedi would allow Anakin to stay in the Order, only being allowed by one vote on the High Council. A vote that if Qui-Gon had died, wouldn't be there. A vote that came directly from Master Yaddle, that suggested that the Jedi Order should allow Skywalker to be trained as a Jedi. If it weren't for Master Yaddle, then chances are that Skywalker wouldn't have been allowed within the Jedi Order. Though if Qui-Gon had died, then the Council would have been guilt-tripped by Kenobi to keep Skywalker in the Order. Regardless, Qui-Gon, after receiving his Padawan, would search relentlessly for Dooku, but could not find him. Dooku, on the other hand, was in the industrial sector, and when he arrived, he found Sidious electrifying Maul for his failure in his mission. Maul tried to plead with his master, suggesting that he couldn't do anything, that Dooku was there and he wasn't supposed to kill his ally. This was a culture shock for Dooku, but with that Yaddle stepping down from the High Council, no one followed Dooku here to find him converging with the other Sith. Maul had a mission, that was to stay here on Coruscant. Dooku, on the other hand, was going to be building up a Separatist alliance on Sereno. Both understood their new objectives, and they immediately followed them, as Dooku left the system for his home world. While Dooku was taken aback by the treatment of Maul, he didn't dissuade him from staying within the Sith ranks. He just believed that it was the right choice to make. He knew it would only be a matter of time until Qui-Gon joined him, but that was far from the truth, as Qui-Gon entered the Council Chambers to say this. Masters, I would like permission from the Council to go into the Outer Rim to train Anakin. It would be best if he spent time around places of trauma, building up a positive image, so that he could be ridden of any possible connections to the dark side. Something else there is, Master Jin. Yes, Master Yoda. I would also like to begin freeing the slaves in the Outer Rim. That is almost out of our range of territory, is it not? Master Windu, I believe it's a positive initiative. The Jedi should have been doing it long before the discovery of Skywalker. Mm, yes. Go forward, Master Wygon. Follow the Force. Free the slaves. May the Force be with you. Thank you, Masters. I believe this will not only benefit the Chosen One, but the galaxy itself. Ironically, the Council didn't see much coming from this. All of them were already surprised that Qui-Gon wanted another student after the whole Obi-Wan debacle. But the Council knew better than to just say no to Qui-Gon. If his mind was set to it, then he would just go along and do it without or with permission. Though, what Qui-Gon was already doing was separating Skywalker from Palpatine, which he noticed a weird interaction between the two of them during the celebration of Naboo. Though, that wasn't the primary reason. Qui-Gon knew he needed Anakin to trust the Jedi. If he didn't trust the Jedi, then he was a lost cause. Freeing the slaves on behalf of the Jedi would be a great first step forward. More than that, Anakin needed to come to terms with his past and move forward. It was to no surprise to Qui-Gon that Skywalker had resentment for Tatooine, but he couldn't allow Anakin's distaste for sand to cloud his mind. Anakin needed to forgive those who hurt him, even Watto, and make steps forward to bettering himself. Harboring nothing but anger for Wada would only bring more pain. If Skywalker could move on from that, then he would truly be able to finally become a Jedi. Plus, going to Tatooine would allow Qui-Gon to free Shmi Skywalker and give Anakin some sense of relief. It was a solid start, and it would really be helpful for Skywalker's development into a Jedi. 
On Mandalore, after years of enjoying peace and having built up a new society, starting new traditions and preparing the people with everything they needed to see, being growth in their planet and being truly proud to be Mandalorian, one of the new holidays was Peace Day. It commemorated what Satine wanted to be the last war Mandalore ever saw. People love this holiday. And so, with three full years of absolute peace and a newly constructed society, capital city, and regrowing terrain across the planet, Satine and Ben decided it was time to do something for themselves. The two of them put together a royal wedding in the year 32 BBY, the same year as the Naboo blockade. Now to preface, this wedding wouldn't coronate Kenobi as Duke of Mandalore. If Satine was marrying a duke, then she would become duchess. But Kenobi couldn't marry in the dukedom. It was something that had to be received through birthright or ascension of power, which this was not that. To Obi-Wan it didn't matter. He got to be with the love of his life, and to him, that's all that really did matter, truthfully. The two of them would prepare a royal wedding, and it would have an excitement of an entire population, all the population other than a few stragglers of the war that ended, though none of them would be present, their honor destroyed by a pacifist. Regardless, the wedding would be beyond elegant. It would capture the hearts of not just the people of Mandalore, but people around the galaxy. Not that anyone knew that Kenobi was a former Jedi, but people were enraptured by a wedding on such a beautiful square in the middle of a Mandalorian city that just several years before was in shambles, with millions dead. The work of Satine and her cabinet showed, and while this wedding wasn't meant to be a show of anything, but a matrimony of true love, it ended up showing the galaxy of how elegant the recovery of Mandalore was. Though part of the wedding was a bit bittersweet for Satine. Her parents weren't present, her father not there to walk her down the aisle, nor her sister to be by her side. She and Obi-Wan in this scenario were of the same. No one but each other, that's all they had, which in some way made their love all the more alluring to the public eye. Neither of them had parents, or even general family present, and so the perception to the people of Mandalore is that the royals were their family. The wedding was held in one of the newly constructed gardens, and it was truly magnificent. But the garden was massive, and so it allowed for thousands of people to show up. Of course, not everyone could see, but it was being broadcast, and they could see through monitors placed above the wedding itself. The reception was a little bit more private, inclusive to the higher-ups within Mandalore society, the people who helped Mandalore recover from the ashes of war. The reception was also great, but Satine and Ben couldn't wait to get out of the public eye, because of course all that was kind of for show. The wedding, the reception, all the people to enjoy, but the time for Satine and Ben to enjoy was when they were able to walk through the palace alone, and enjoy each other's presence. They'd enjoyed peace, but it was magical, something out of a storybook, totally impeccably beautiful. Love was remarkable, and the former Jedi and Duchess of Mandalore were rejoicing in its magnitude. With the royal couple in the galactic spotlight, Mandalore was thrust into a position of power on the galactic stage. With strong leadership, strong society, and strong imagery, they had the ability to whip together allies, any allies they wanted, trade deals, supply lines, manufacturing facilities, whatever they needed. And unlike any time before in Mandalorian history, Mandalore was becoming a booming economy that thrived in peace, but not war. But of course, there were those that this peace was not good for. The ever so repugnant Pre Vizsla on the mood of Concordia hoped that he could end Satine's rule someday, but how could he? The galaxy would turn against him if she was touched with a ten-foot pole. A couple more years would pass by, only three to be precise, and the Jedi would see the return of the Chosen One. Qui-Gon Jinn had freed most of the slaves in the Outer Rim, and the Republic was currently working on seizing all the Zygerian assets to starve them out of slavery. The preface, this was not an option set forth by Chancellor Palpatine, rather a new voice in the Republic Senate in Senator Amidala. She was young, but she was the former Queen of Naboo. She was four during the Naboo crisis, and now she was 17. But her position towards the Zygerian Empire was to cut off all their extended resources until they stopped slavery, which at first didn't work. But when their population ran dry on supplies, materials, and everything else to make an empire function, they pleaded with the Republic, only to be forced to withdraw from slavery. During these three years, Dooku tried reaching out to his apprentice multiple times, but Qui-Gon gave him the cold shoulder. The reason is, Qui-Gon learned that Dooku abandoned the Order for what seemed to be the glory and riches of his house. Dooku was from a very powerful house, Sereno, and to Qui-Gon it looked like Dooku just abandoned the Order to get rich. He wasn't a fan of that, especially while he was training a student about humility. Anakin grew really well with Qui-Gon, exponentially well with someone who he considered very easily to be a father figure. Dooku, because of losing contact with Qui-Gon Jinn, would rethink his position. But the Jedi Council, on the other hand, believed they were hot on the trail of the Sith Lord. They had been tracking a singular ship movement. Their only reason being is that they had a lead. 
They could follow this one individual who had been bouncing on and off system several times. The reason the council was interested was because of hologram footage showing Darth Maul at the fight of Naboo, though this footage also seemed to reveal that Dooku was working with the Sith, by keeping the battle from ending, when in reality the Jedi could have just easily defeated Maul and brought him to justice. The ship the Jedi Council was tracking had made stops to the industrial sector and to Sereno. It seemed a little too good to be true. Now yes, there were millions of ships in the airways above Coruscant every planetary rotation, otherwise 24 hours, but not even thousands of ships went into the industrial sector merely hundreds. The Jedi didn't find most of these ships suspicious, because it didn't take much to find out if they were pirates or smugglers if they tracked them from more than two rotations, because pirates and smugglers stayed in the industrial sector for less than 24 hours. They frequently bounced out after two to three hours, whereas the ship they were tracking was staying put for a couple of days, extended periods of time. The next time the Jedi saw the ship leave, they tracked it, dispatching Plo Koon, Ceci Ten, Even Peel, Yaddle, Depa Balaba, and Kiatamunde to follow it though the rest of the present council would move to the location of which the Sith left. The Jedi following the unmarked vessel would arrive over Sereno, just as it had before them, and then they would follow the ship down to the surface to where it would land outside of Castle Sereno. Now mind you, the Jedi were using an unmarked vessel. Palpatine was moving Maul back and forth between Coruscant and Sereno, the reason being is Sidious wanted Maul to do individual training with Dooku, but Sidious kept Maul on a tight leash. He did so before the invasion of Naboo, and he did so even more so now. He wasn't faithful that his student could just successfully pull off a victory, and so Sidious only allowed Maul on Coruscant and Sereno because of that. Though the vessel Maul used wasn't the Sith Marauder, it was actually just a basic fighter, so that he'd blend in with the rest of the population. This was a massive backfire for Sidious, when half the Jedi Council rolled up on his crib and knocked him into the Shadow Realm. The other Jedi who landed on Castle Sereno, on the other hand, would walk out to find two Sith dueling. The Jedi Masters were all disappointed. They saw Maul, and that was a known Sith, but seeing Dooku with a red lightsaber was haunting. He was such a well-liked Jedi, and he threw all of it away for nothing. The Jedi Council members present weren't going to play nice, igniting all their lightsabers and moving in quickly. Both Maul and Dooku were exceptional talents, but not even they could stand to the likes of the council members present. Each of them were on the council for a reason, and they were not fighting Sidious. Mundi, Deppa, and Plo were all masterful duelists out of the six Jedi that arrived, and with them leading the charge, it would literally be impossible for Maul and Dooku to come out on top. The end of the battle would see a dead Maul and a captured Dooku. While Dooku hadn't been found of doing anything during this time away from the Order, an investigation would lead the Jedi to Kamino and unveiling a terrible plot to undermine the Republic and start a war. With the Jedi revealing Sidious as a Chancellor, they would have their own issues to pick around and pick up around the galaxy and the Republic. While the Republic was under a tense standoff, Mandalore itself was doing rather fine, though the husband of Duchess Satine was becoming increasingly wary of the Governor of Concordia. Ben wasn't one to simply accuse, but considering he now had a three-year-old daughter, he wasn't going to take any chances. Both Satine and Ben found out about their daughter, named Astrid, shortly after the reception during the wedding. It was a surprise to be sure, but a welcome one. It fit in perfectly, and the royal child would be embraced by the public spotlight, just like her parents had been during their wedding not too long beforehand. Regardless, Obi-Wan told Satine that he would like to take a group of Mandalorian guards to investigate Concordia. She didn't really understand this. Well, she did, but she didn't understand the need to bring the guard. Obi-Wan had been using his lightsaber over the last several years, since he started his stay here on Mandalore. He practiced consistently. He sparred with the royal guard. Satine didn't mind. She was glad Obi-Wan did something that made him happy. He was happy, she was happy, she was happy, he was happy. It worked both ways. Sure, she didn't want to partake in it, but that's because it was his thing, not hers. Obi liked it because it kept him fit. It also kept him active. He enjoyed that. It also helped him stay connected to the Force, which he also liked very much. Obi-Wan and his guard would depart for Concordia on what they would call an official business. They wanted everything to feel as official as possible, as if there were no heads being turned at this occasion. When Obi-Wan arrived, he dispatched members of his guard to investigate the area, that they were under explicit orders to not engage anybody if they found anybody. But if they saw any members of a resistance, then they were told to call the Royal Guard on Mandalore and have them call men for reinforcements. Obi-Wan made a specific point to not tell Satine about this specific fact, firstly because he wanted to keep this on the down low as much as possible, secondly, he didn't want her to stress out about it, and thirdly, because he didn't assume anything bad was going to happen here, he just was doing this because he was afraid that there was possibly an issue. Of course she knew of him and the guard going to Concordia, but everything else was relatively unaware to her. Kenobi and Vizsla got to talking and everything seemed 
seemed fine. Previsla had no intention of picking a beef with Kenobi, mostly because his plans weren't finished yet, but when the Mandalorian Royal Guard came in and told Previsla they needed to explain himself, Visla was obviously confused. But when he saw the Mandalorian helmet in the guard's hands, he knew the plans had been foiled. Visla kept a blaster under his table and grabbed it and shot. Kenobi was an unknown Jedi, and because Visla thought Kenobi was just a regular man, he expected to kill the man who married the Duchess. But when he raised his blaster, it was thrown upwards and shot as it crashed into the ceiling. Visla ran as the guards turned on their staves. Obi-Wan told the men to stay behind him. He grabbed his lightsaber and chased Visla through the halls of the house. Obi-Wan used the force and threw the guards backwards as he ducked. The darksaber cut through the wall. Obi-Wan ignited his lightsaber. Obi kept it on his person at all times, just in case it happened to come up that he needed it, and this was a perfect chance to use it. And Obi slashed at Vizsla as he collided with the darksaber. The two of them got into a strong standoff. Vizsla was a Mandalorian warrior, but Kenobi had combined the warrior ways of the Mandalore with his Jedi training. These ways were learned through practice with the Mandalorian guard in Sundaria. Regardless, the two of them pushed each other backwards. Kenobi used his leverage to push pre Vizsla backwards too. Vizsla didn't have a jetpack, and he didn't have any armor on. Neither of these men had Mandalorian armor, and they were just fighting at a fair advantage, as long as Obi-Wan didn't use a force to throw Vizsla off balance, which Obi-Wan had no intention of doing. Kenobi swung forward. Without staying in the Jedi Order or losing Qui-Gon, Kenobi stuck to using Form 4, which was a lot more aggressive than Form 3. Vizsla shoved his blade forward and he got stuck in the wall. Obi-Wan threw his elbow into Vizsla's jaw before swinging down and cutting the darksaber into pieces, shattering the hilt, before using his foot and kicking Pre Vizsla off of his feet. Pre Vizsla cried out, the darksaber was a part of Mandalorian history, it was a pride of their people. Kenobi took a step forward, holding his blade to Pre Vizsla, telling him, You're wrong Vizsla, that blade saw the deaths of millions because so many fought over it. It's a curse to Mandalore and now it's been extinguished. Finally, all those lost souls can enjoy their peace. Guards, arrest this terrorist. I will show the rest of his men there is no fight anymore. The guards ran forward and picked up Vizsla, putting him in shackles and telling him that he would see the rest of his fate inside of a last sarcophagus inside of the Mandalorian capital. Vizsla cried out as he was dragged away in shackles. Kenobi grabbed the Darksaber pieces and took it to the location where the guards told him they found the Mandalorian camp. When Kenobi got there, he was threatened, but upon holding the Darksaber up, the Mandalorians moved aside, many of them kneeling before him, as he came to Bo-Katan. Obi-Wan told her that it was time to make amends with her sister. Obi-Wan turned around and gave a resounding speech, telling all the Mandalorians, It's time to stop this bloodshed. The curse has been lifted. The Darksaber will no longer haunt our people. There will be an opportunity for all of you to remember your ancestors' past and their warrior ways. But the times had changed. Mandalore is respected across the galaxy. Satine has brought our people back from the ashes of civil war, you must see it. There's nothing wrong with embracing the memories of those you loved, but repeating their mistakes is insanity. My friends, join us. It's okay to move on from relics of the past. It's okay to embrace a new beginning. This is the way. The Mandalorians looked at each other. They didn't want to give up their stuff, but Obi-Wan wasn't telling them to give up their stuff. No one was. Embrace the past, but don't live it was the message. Not forget what happened before. Obi-Wan told them to their faces while holding an object they all worshipped. Now, what did they do? The first Mandalorian stood up, took off his helmet, and grabbed Obi-Wan's hand, and said, This is the way. Another one stood up and did the same, and she said, This is the way. Another Mandalorian followed in suit. This is the way. Bo-Katan fell into their footsteps, being the last one to continue this chant. This is the way. Obi-Wan would be sure that all these Mandalorians would get a pass. The only one who would be in trouble was Pre Vizsla, especially after learning that he was going to try and overthrow the throne. When Obi-Wan returned to Mandalore, he found his wife and told her about what he said to the Mandalorians. Satine was in the throne room, and by her side was Astrid playing with her toys. Hello, my loves. Satine. On Concordia, I defeated Pre Vizsla, and I destroyed the Dark Saber. I believe we should put the weapon into a museum. But on the other hand, I told the other Mandalorians that they could still remember their ancestors, but it was time to embrace the present. I was curious if we could do anything to avoid them from having another meltdown. Well, my dear, I'm firstly glad to know you're all right. I was worried about you. Secondly, I think that's something we should explore. Something for the old Mandalorian-obsessed individuals to do, to allow them some comfort in the changing times. As for the wicked weapon, it shall go in the new museum. I do have an idea, Satin. We could allow the Mandalorians to do tournaments. Something for them to use their skills in a non-violent way. Allow them to use their grapples, the jetpacks, the visors, and make it a couple teams. 
like a blue and yellow and white team all working for a common goal. Oh, I do love that idea. But honey... Yes, dear? White, blue and yellow are our clan's colors. Well, I know that. <laughs> <laughs> Duchess Satine and Ben would construct a week-long televised game that would be for Mandalorians to contribute in. No one else around the galaxy could contribute because it was made for Mandalorians who wanted to idolize their past. It was a nice way for Mandalore to explain that they moved on from the past. To say, we've moved on, but we still remember the good things. The entire event was non-violent per request of the Duchess, because she wanted the young minds who absorbed the games to see them as that, games. The Mandalorians who participated were exhilarated, because they built up teams, typically a mass of their clans or houses, so House Vizsla and House Kreese got involved. From time to time, Obi-Wan would participate with his house, House Kreese, and he would don some gorgeous armor, customary of those that belonged to a royal. But it was all for fun. It was a great team bonding exercise to accomplish a team goal. It kept peace on Mandalore and allowed the foundlings who idolized the way to grow up and compete in it for a way to live so they wouldn't have to rely on violence to do so. Of course, not all the Mandalorians did this, and some of them went off to become bounty hunters and mercenaries, but they died out. But a big thing for Satine was pushing away the gambling companies from entering Mandalore and turning the sport into a gamble fest, which thanks to Satine never happened. Mandalore would surge its way in the galaxy, bolstering much success. As for the Jedi, they would continue their servitude to the Republic, as Skywalker would grow up and take on an apprentice in Ahsoka Tano, raising her to a Jedi Knight. There would be a short-term war that would break out between the Trade Federation and the Republic, but nothing critical would happen other than a couple skirmishes. The galaxy itself would find a greater peace, and as for the star-crossed lovers on Mandalore, they would rejoice in total happiness with one another until their natural deaths many, many years later. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is the end of our story. Again, special thanks to Benjamin Wells, Tiger Boy, Darth Revan, Pimp Daddy Bane, Darth Cheesy, Apollo, Mad Men, Astutes, Anakin 003, Lemon Knight, Flynn Van Seas, and Lord Deadwing for supporting the channel. Hit 2,000 likes on this video. I don't know what's coming next, but it is. Actually, it's a miniseries. Miniseries comes out on Saturday. Epic video. Episode 3 is effing awesome. Awesome. You guys are going to be so happy when you see it. Great episode. It's my favorite so far. Um, Otherwise, let's talk about our story here. So, okay, here we go. Here we go. The hate comments are coming in. All right. Uh, if you guys didn't know, I based almost all this off of Wikipedia um, and and all the lore based around Satine, which is canon. Um, so, I, I know I've talked about liking Satine, but when I was making sure I got all the research right for this video, um, that was mostly Satine. You know, all this stuff happened literally. You know, like the the destruction that happened to Mandalore. Like Mandalore was literally a dying planet. She saved a dying planet. Um, and I know most of you guys don't like her because she's not true Mandalore, but, um, you know, being as young as she was, there's no confirmed age for her, and I wanted to keep her pretty similar to Obi-Wan's age. Uh, I think she's a little bit younger, but, you know, I think them being the same age, but just different, like, he's, like, like for example, he's born in January, she's, like, born in March or something. Like, something like that. Like, they're, like, the same age, but, like, he's a little older. Um, I think that's just the same case, but there isn't like a confirmed birth date for her, especially since in The Mandalorian, Bo-Katan refuses to acknowledge her sister exists, which I don't get me started on that. But I wanted to make the, the, the bond between Obi-Wan and Satine feel natural. I didn't want it to feel forced, you know? It's very natural in Clone Wars, the way it's introduced is very natural, the way we get introduced to their connection is very natural, and so we don't really have a backstory for that. There's not really much known about that time period and so i wanted to contribute to that a little bit with like the first couple like i think it's like the first 10 minutes of the video are literally them on the run and i wanted them to have that moment because it's like it's not going to be like romeo and juliet it's like oh yeah we're not going to fall in love like they're going to love each other but they're like like it's going to be like uh this is kind of scary and i'm relying on you with my life and i don't really want to think about falling in love with you but they did love each other you know by the time they were ready to leave they did love each other and so um, you know, I wanted that to feel natural, build that naturally, um, for them to, to feel that way. And then for Satine to say, yeah, I want you, but the truth is I'm more, I care more about my people. That's, that's just who she is. Um, again, I always write based on the characters. I find it very unlikely that Satine would say, hey, I want you to come here and then like say, screw the people. Like, I just don't see Satine doing that. I don't think she's going to be like, oh yeah, I, I, I love you. And so my people are going to suffer because I love you. Like, she's not going to do that. So, you know having Satine and Obi-Wan have this like really natural progression that takes time, that takes patience, it, it feels a lot more rewarding. I'm not gonna lie, I'm really excited for this video because I think this is one of the best one of the best videos I've done lately. Um, not gonna lie, both these both these past Mandalorian videos, bangers. Um, and I'm very excited about the, these videos for you guys. Uh, the, the one that I did last week, this one, and there's gonna be a Mandalorian video next week, I assure you. But 
like these are a lot of fun for me and I'm enjoying them because they're fun they're a lot of fun um, and I got to explore a society that you know is very popular and talk about it in the ideas that aren't exactly as popular which is also fun because I get to kind of go against the status quo anyways I hope you all enjoyed this was a fun video again I hope it's a banger for you guys I thought it was really good I'm really happy with it anyways I love you all spread the love and always remember my friends may the force be with you Thank you.